Mm -hmm. Thank you. So good evening uh, to those who are joining us here in Zoom and also to our audience watching us live on YouTube and Facebook. My name is Lenka and I would like to welcome you at this event, a talk by writer, writer lecturer, artist and curator Joanna Zielinska. Before we start, let me say a few uh, important things. Um, first, uh, this event is being recorded and live streamed. Uh, so I hope you are okay with it. And if not, you can always turn off your camera. Uh, so you will not be uh, seen on the live stream. Then the next thing uh, is that the festival is being supported uh, by Abacus Foundation and uh, also using public funds provided by Slovak Arts Council and the city of Prague. This event is a uh, part of a program track uh, of this festival, which is called Shaping the Future Synthetic Realities. Uh, which is critically looking at the places where the current development in artificial intelligence crosses with art and design practices. Uh, we invite you all to join the discussion after Joanna's presentation. You can ask questions here in uh, the chat in the Zoom or on YouTube uh, or Facebook, as well as on our Discord, where we have dedicated channel to this event. And also, if you feel inspired and want to talk some more after this event ends, uh, you are welcome to come hang out in the Discord voice channels, which we are using as our festival bars. So we will share the link to Discord and in the chat. And now please uh, let me introduce our guest, Joanna Zielinska. Uh, Joanna works as a professor of new media and communications at Goldsmiths University of London. Uh, she's author of a number of books. Uh, the newest one is called AI Art, Machine Visions and Warped Dreams. And she also wrote The End of Man, A Feminist Counter Apocalypse and uh, Non-Human Photography. She is also involved in experimental and collaborative publishing projects. And her art practice involves playing with different kinds of image-based media. Tonight in her talk, Joanna will argue that to understand the promise of artificial intelligence for the creative fields, we need to address the role and position of the human in the current technical setup. So welcome, Joanna. Thank you so much for coming to Uroboros Festival. And thank you for uh, that you, will, you came to share your thoughts with us. And we are all excited to hear your presentation. So the virtual stage is yours. Thank you, Lenka, for the invitation. And I'm really pleased to be here with you. Let me just start by sharing my screen, which... Uh... It's okay. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, um, my talk today picks up some threads from my newly published uh, book, AI Art, Machine Visions and Warped Dreams. And I wanted to give a shout out to my colleagues at Open Humanities Press, which is a scholar led nonprofit publishing collective designed to make works of critical theory available to all for free. So go and have a look at the website. There are lots of free books there on a variety of topics to do with cultural theory, critical theory. Now, my own book discusses the relationship between AI, creativity and invention. The impetus for writing it was provided by my witnessing a real outpouring of computer-made artifacts at art festivals over the last few years. For example, computer-generated paintings that resembled Vincent van Gogh's work, or an abstract modernist masterpiece, or Microsoft ordering the production of a new Rembrandt, because we didn't have enough. So this kind of deluge of so-called artificial intelligence art has been taking place um, against the wider debate about AI unfolding in society, where the public has shown fascination with what AI can do and create, but also fear connected with the automation of the labor force and the potential elimination of people from their jobs, or even the annihilation of the human species. So for me, the stories that accompany the rise of AI and the talk about AI's creativity and the potential threats have been at least as interesting as the actual artifacts that are being produced under the label of AI art. So my book responds to this moment, to this production of many different things labeled, rightly or wrongly, AI art. My aim was to interrogate this term and explore the confluence of ideas, beliefs, and sociopolitical forces behind it. And to do so, I wanted to go beyond the question of whether computers or machines or robots can be creative or not. 
So when people think about AI and computer art, this is the question that often gets raised. Now, I do make an attempt to answer it in the book, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, you know, but I also try to show why this question, are computers creative or not, is not the best question to ask, and that will, won't really get us anywhere. Instead, I propose to ask some other, and I think more important questions, such as, should the recent use of AI in image making and image curation encourage us to ask some bigger questions about the very purpose of artistic production? Does it encourage us to interrogate once again, who art is for? Uh, who is the artist now? What is art for? What is the nature of the art market and art institution? Can technology and AI challenge the status quo in any way? Does AI create new conditions and new audiences for art? And what will art after AI look like? Who will, be, who will it be for? So you could say that the book is intended as a provocation or an invitation to a discussion, and I hope we'll have a bit of a discussion afterwards about some of these issues. As part of the book's argument, I developed this thesis, which is also a title of my talk today, that we have always been artificially intelligent, and that we hum what we humans call intelligence has always been artificial. Now, this idea goes back to the recently deceased French philosopher Bernard Stiegler, and his concept of originary technicity. The belief that humans have always been technical, that we have emerged as technical beings through simple technologies such as Flintstones, fire, clothing, language. Language is not such a simple technology, neither is clothing. But So these ideas build on Gilbert Simondon's notion of subjectivity emerging through technology. So there is no such a thing as a pre-technological human. The human is in his, her, their cognitive, corporeal and affective capacities has been produced in conjunction with technology. This idea is also present in second order cybernetics and its notion of the system. So all of this has led me to think about intelligence as something that is not only limited to humans and that's also a product of a technical relation. And when we think of intelligence in this way, language can also be seen as a technology that is as both a signal of intelligence and a producer of intelligence. If we look at the development of art, you know, through history, art has always been produced with the help of all sorts of externalities, technologies, machines, apparatuses, neurological enhancements, hallucinations, dreams, viruses, biological organism substances, but also cultural conventions. So the reason I'm introducing this idea that we have always been artificially intelligent as a scaffolding for my ideas on AI is because I wanted to depart from the notion of the artist as a singular genius sitting in his, and it's very often his, garret or studio and producing being creative from the bottom of his soul. Instead, I want to show that creativity and the production of art are premised upon a form of intelligence that is always already networked. It's linked with technology as well as with other humans, and that goes back thousands of years. We can also find this idea revisited in an interesting way in the work of Brazilian Czech philosopher Willem Flusser and his explanation of the conditions of possibility for the production of art and photography, and also of human freedom within systemic confinement. Flusa recognizes that we are to some extent machines, and that we are subject to the operations of apparatuses, with these apparatuses being both sociopolitical and technical. And yet within this idea, he tries to seek conditions of freedom. And finally, Feminist and post-colonial critiques have shown us that not all systems, not all machines are born equal. Hence, in recognizing our entanglement with technologies, we need to interrogate what particular technologies do. The technology of policing, for example, is executed very differently for different people. And it is also different, let's say, from the technology of education, although this technology in itself can be both productive and oppressive. Cybernetics offers us a system view, a systemic view where all dimensions are entangled and communicate with each other. But feminism and postcolonial critiques show how we need to stop and examine particular moments within the system. 
So that's a kind of a little bit of a theoretical framing. But to give you a bit of a kind of context, life context of where I'm coming from with this line of thinking, and the primary concern of my work over many years has been the constitution of the human as both a species and a historical subject. Adopting the geological probe of deep time, I have looked at the emergence of the human in conjunction with the surrounding technologies and artifacts, tools such as stones used as hammers, or more sophisticated ones such as computers, language, art. I have also explored the entanglements of human and non-human forms of intelligence and perception. And this set of interests is what concerns my recent writings in non-human photography, The End of Man, and this most recent book, AI Art. Now, the planetary perspective of my work as adopted in this video called Exit Man, which is now playing silently in the background, finds its anchoring for me in the socio-political concerns of the here and now, primarily the ecological and economic crises, but also the gendering and racialization of the apocalyptic narratives brought in as responses to those crises. So as well as looking into the human and non-human past, I'm interested in the future of the human, and of the human habitat. And for this human future to have a future, it needs to be considered and experienced in contiguity with the needs and demands of non-humans, from animals through to mycelium, insects, plants, and rocks. So my method of working combines philosophical inquiry with artistic practice, which involves still and moving images. And I see this hybrid mode of inquiry as being more conducive to the interrogation of complex issues that need to be thought about, sensed, and encountered as part of the same cognitive space. By looking from below, around, and askew, I aim to offer a critical vision that refracts the current images of the world as we know it, and that offers a glimpse of a world to come. Now, art on its own as a series of aesthetic objects to be appreciated for their timeless beauty doesn't interest me so much. Rather, I want to pursue, both as a maker and a viewer, the kind of art that offers something else, an opening onto the world, an engagement with it, a critique. Art doesn't have to be didactic, like you know, aestheticizing the climate crisis, coronavirus, human extinction at the end of the world. But rather, for me, art has to function as a kind of stir. So it should still have an aesthetic function. It should touch and potentially open us towards a transformation without prior guarantees. But I also believe in what I called in the book a paragonal function of art, all the activities accompanying the artwork wall texts, discussions, panels, festivals, online and offline, but also interventions outside the gallery spaces, in the city or countryside, educational activities within the university or outside the university and the art school or design school. Art itself can become a conversation piece, but also a call to arms. Now, this critical drive carries across both my art practice and my writing, although in each case it's exercised differently. And thus, as well as asking many questions about intelligence, creativity, and AI, my AI art book also entails a critique, but not in the sense that I want to tell people that AI is really bad and we should be really scared of the robot takeover, although maybe we should, but that's not really the, the central point of what I'm trying to do. My position doesn't involve a total rejection of AI as a technology or as a concept. On the contrary, the book comes from a place of fascination for me, a fascination with the possibilities, narratives, stories, and technical incarnations of AI. But at the same time, I'm quite suspicious about the current social and political claims about AI and also about the role of art in validating those claims. So as part of this, I'm concerned about some dominant forms of AI aesthetics with their frequently visual banality, and more importantly, about the service that this kind of banal, although garish art, often gets put to, which is legitimating platform capitalism 
through the application of psychopolitics. This form of art ends up enacting what uh, Franco Bifo Berardi has called neurototalitarianism, where our minds and bodies are being colonized by GAN's vi visual acrobatics. GAN's are generative adversarial networks. I'll talk about them later on. But, you know, so art produced with GAN's, it kind of puts us into a strange state of euphoric stasis. So ends the book in a conversation with Bifo, among others, offers a critique of this form of capitalism by asking to what extent AI art is mobilized to enact and enforce this particular political formation. And finally, I also ask if we can do things otherwise in art and in politics. And so my, my argument is that this critique is really needed right now, especially as far as AI driven art is concerned, because much of AI art that currently gets attention from curators and audiences is precisely what we could call platform capitalism art. Propped up by the generative and extractivist logic of Silicon Valley, it generates visual and algorithmic variations within the enclosed system while teasing the public with the promise of novelty. Kindly put, much of generative AI art celebrates the technological novelty of computer vision, fast processing power, and connection-making algorithms by regaling us with a dazzling spectacle of colors and contrasts, as well as the sheer volume of data. And kindly put, it becomes a glorified version of Candy Crush that seductively maims our bodies and brains into submission and acquiescence. Are the draws on deep learning and big data sets to get computers to do something supposedly interesting with images often ends up offering a mere psychedelic sea of squiggles, giggles, and not very much in between. It can be fascinating because it's so disorienting. We don't even know how to look at it. It looks uncanny and it challenges our perception. But it is, first of all, art as spectacle. However, these imitation experiments with generative adversarial networks, producing works that look like those of Francis Bacon, for example, or Van Gogh, open an interesting debate about our conventionally accepted parameters of authorship, originality, expertise, and taste. The new scientist has raised an important philosophical point with regard to simulation works, saying, and I quote, if it is so easy to break down the style of some of the world's most original composers into computer code, that means some of the best human artists are more machine-like than we would like to think. Now, a similar line of thinking was offered by Flusser, who argued that since the times of the Industrial Revolution, image makers have existed in a close-knit relationship with their apparatuses, facilitating new kinds of collaborations. For Flusser, it was a new kind of function in which human beings and apparatuses merged into a unity. Now, Flusser was writing about photographers, yet his argument extends to other forms of human creativity. This human machinic unity meant for, for him that humans now function as a function of their apparatuses, and the pandemic has only exacerbated this condition, of course. Our creative activity is therefore understood as an execution of the machine's program and involves making a selection from the range of options determined by the algorithm. We could suggest that this algorithmic constitution of humans started long before the Industrial Revolution, or even that has been foundational to the constitution of the human as a technical being, who, as we said earlier, was referenced to the work of Bernard Stiegler actuates this humanness in relation with technical objects, such as fire, sticks, and stones. Now, humans' everyday functioning also depends on the execution of a program, a sequence of possibilities enabled by various couplings of adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine, otherwise known as DNA. Now, this proposition shouldn't be taken as a postulation on my part of a mindless technological or biological determinism that would remove from humans any possibility of action and any responsibility for the actions we take. 
yet accepting our affinity with other living beings across the evolutionary spectrum and recognizing that our human lives are subject to biochemical reactions that are not fully in control, we're not fully in control of from blushing through to aging and dying does undermine the humanist parameters of the debate about creativity, art and AI. Undermining the strict distinction between humans and machines, our supposed genius and artificial intelligence, such a post-human view of the human recalibrates human creativity as partly computational. Once again, to say this is not to resign ourselves to passivity by concluding that we humans are incapable of creating anything, that we are nothing but clockwork devices responding to impulses. It's only to concede after Flusser that just as the imagination of the apparatus is greater than that of all artists across history, the imagination of the program called life in which we all participate and which is an outcome of multiple processes, processes running across various scales of the universe far exceeds our human imagination. Now, to understand how humans can operate within the constraints of the apparatus that is part of them becomes a new urgent task for a much needed post-humanist art theory. In this new paradigm for understanding art and creativity more broadly, the human would be conceived as part of the machine dispositive for technical system and not its sole inventor, owner and ruler. A post-humanist art history would see instead the production of all artworks from cave paintings through the works of so-called great masters and contemporary experiments with all kinds of technologies as being produced by human artists in an assembly with a plethora of non-human agents, drives, impulses, viruses, drugs, various substances and devices, as well as all sorts of networks from mycelium through to the internet. So this frequently posed question, can computers be creative, which I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, therefore reveals itself to be rather reductive because it is premised on a pre-technological idea of the human as a standalone subject of decision and action. The computer, be it in the shape of a PC or an algorithm, is only seen here as an imperfect approximation of such a human. Thus, we are better off asking after Flusser whether the human can actually be creative, or more precisely, in what way can the human be creative? For me, the answer to these questions is an ethical and political interpolation. And I do believe that even though we recognize different technological, machinic and physiological constraints on the human, degrees of freedom and emancipation are still possible for us within those constraints. But to figure this out, to figure out those degrees of freedom, the model of creativity as creation ex nihilo or creation from nothing needs to be challenged. Instead, we need to position the artist as being in the world, always already from the uh, always already feeding from the link with other human and non-human elements. We need to remember that art is also already a form of extractivism. The question then is how to make this extractivism a little bit more ethical, a little less self-centered and self-aggrandizing, self and a little bit more world-aggrandizing, so to speak. I should explain the rationale for this argument and outline what I'm bouncing against here, perhaps. So as demonstrated earlier, a rather truncated concept of creativity is used in some forms of AI art, which is reduced to the repetition of the same. So while going against this idea of, oh, this is amazing, the computer has painted something that looks like the work of a grandmaster, in the book I was in, oh, Van Gogh, in the book I was interested in looking at other more systemic theories of creativity. And the reason I was interested in doing this was because I thought that this truncated model of creativity was just producing works that were both mindless and pointless, works that I described earlier as Candy Crush. So this model of creativity ends up propping up the companies of platform capitalism, as we said, for example, Google with its artist program. 
but it threatens to close down on more radical and unpredictable forms of creativity, which for me involve looking for things that could push the system to get out of sync, to open itself up. Of course, we want and need some systems to run correctly, but we want to open up others. And, you know, the kind of, uh, especially the kind of techno capitalism is one system that we might or I might at least be interested in opening up. So not all systems, as we know, are born equal, have equal tasks or equal forms of embeddedness. So the idea that I'm going against is that of creativity understood as repetition of the same was just a bit more of, of the same, but also creativity as absolute novelty, the way God is supposed to have created the world. And to do to undertake this critique, I rely on Whitehead's idea of creativity as something that occurs in the environment, which is what psychologist James Gibson calls affordances, possibilities emerging already from the environment. We could say that things happen in the encounter or mutual unfolding between the organism and the world. And here I rely on the work of my colleague at Goldsmith, Mark Dinverno, who together with Arthur Still, claim that AI research would benefit from adopting the concept of intelligence based on attentive inquiry into the relationship between the human and the environment. So the question that we need to ask are, for whose benefit are we designing? How do we ensure that AI doesn't just become the next step in making the environment more subjugated? Creativity and design in relation to the environment still require that we ask certain questions which relate to our human responsibility for what we can and can't do within those conditions of constraint we discussed earlier. So we need to recognize the nexus of forces, beings, agents, demands, and to act from within that nexus. So rather than having a model of the human as someone that stands outside the world and of technology being a mere tool, we need a more dynamic and entangled model of creativity. This can also be found in the work of cognitive scientist, Margaret Bowden, who has suggested that being creative means diverging from the established path that we carve out and then follow each day. This is seen in her idea of transformational creativity. But again, I don't think that we can explore this without bringing in politics. You could say that politicians such as Boris Johnson with his Brexit idea or Donald Trump were diverging from the established path. Some people would describe their actions in terms of creative distraction. But this is why there are other concepts and other frameworks that need to be brought in apart from this you know, transformation, radical kind of shift. Not all sorts of creativity should be valued in exactly the same way, of course. Not all forms of divergence from the track are the same. Also, the logic of Silicon Valley is often very much in the vein of let's break things and see what happens. So divergence from the set path and creativity as looking for alternative paths and solutions have to be brought together with concepts and philosophies of the world, with political models of the world. Creativity needs to be considered in those terms. It can't be considered as an abstract concept. It can't be considered as an abstract concept because if it is, and it ind indeed often is in places like Silicon Valley, the theory of creativity as absolute novelty sneaks in through the back door and we end up with neo-libertarian theories of politics and economics. And I certainly don't want that. I'm not interested in that. Now, many artists have explored the problem of creativity, experimenting with questions of human and machine uh, kind of production of art and design in a way that goes beyond the humanist paradigm. Robot art by Portuguese artist Lionel Moura is an ensemble of small robotic vehicles traversing a large sheet of paper and leaving multicolored line marks on it to create a large abstraction. Moura explains that his robots have been equipped with environmental awareness and a small brain that runs algorithms based on simple rules. The images obtained are not designed in advance, but are rather the result of randomness in communication between the robots on the canvas. The artist's principal interest lies in exploring complexity in art, produced in collaboration with robots. Moura says, whether a work of art is made directly by a human artist or is the product of any other type of process is nowadays of no relevance. More decisive, 
is whether or not uh, a new art form expands the field of art. Since rare words like those I use are able to generate novelty, it must also be recognized that they have at least some degree of creativity. So that's, you know, Mora speaking. Mora seems to be partially resigning from the role of the artist and ceding the creative ground to the machine and the algorithm. But it's only a very particular and arguably old fashioned and masculinist idea of the artist as a creative genius at odds with the world, one who's also standing above the world that is being challenged here. The robotic artist unveiled by Mura and his predecessors is of the world. He or she, as the case may be in many current experiments with AI art, is also in the world. There is therefore a subtle sociopolitical message implied in this repositioning. Now, Estonian artist Katja Novitskova's work is also worth highlighting in this respect. Her recent project feels like a spoof version of the artificially intelligent work which mesmerizes and seduces the viewer. Yet there is no visual seduction here. Instead, the visitor to her strange archive of images and objects is faced with a set of puzzles. What are these electronic cradles doing here? And what's happened to the human babies they were meant to be cradling? What do these alien-like creatures hovering above them stand for? Novitskova's post-internet dystopia has been described by Toki Lickerberg as art for another intelligence. The artifacts included in the exhibition may cause a sense of information overload in a human viewer, but algorithms will be able to detect immediately what a given piece of data indicates. Novitskova's work offers a premonition of the world to come a world in which not only the majority of images are not being taken with the human viewer in mind, but also one in which machines constantly perceive, communicate with, and exist for other machines. We could therefore perhaps suggest that drawing on non-human databases and modes of perception, Novitskova creates work for an artificial intelligence which is not here yet, inviting a speculation on the future of different species. AI here stands for another intelligence. And I find this a very thought provoking idea, trying to imagine art for an intelligence that is not here yet. Will it still look like art? Will future be, you know, beings recognize it as such? Will we? Will there still be an us in the future? So moving towards the end of my talk, I wanted to tell you about, tell you about how my work has developed after the AI art book. So currently I'm working on perception as arguably the key mode of engagement with the world in different species. And this project involves looking at the reconfiguration of the eye in the digital age and at the humanist blind spot in machine vision. And as part of this work, I'm investigating the role played by images, especially mechanically produced images, such as photographs in human becoming. And as part of this new research, I recently made a short video called Neuromatic, which deals with the problem of machine and computer vision. To make this video, which is uh, over six minutes long, uh, and has, it has sound and a voiceover, uh, so I reanimated with the help of a big gun algorithm available via Art Breeder, some historical and contemporary images of arts and brains. The images were taken from the Welcome Collection, which is a repository of medical images in the UK. The idea behind this work was to raise some questions about perception unfolding between the eye, the brain and the world in humans and machines. The video's title, Neuromatic, is a coinage of two terms, neuro referring to nerves or the nervous system and matic, standing for something referring to the eye, which is mati in Greek, but also referring to matic as an automatic willing to perform. So neuromatic captures this link between the eye and the brain and the visual apparatus, but also suggests provocatively, playfully, that vision itself can be understood in machinic terms. In terms of the look and technique of this video, I'm aware that in AI art, I said some rather critical things about GAN aesthetics, you know, generative adversarial networks. But I've also obviously relied on GANs to produce this video, maybe not obviously. 
But I'm not claiming that GANs or indeed any other AI-driven art algorithms or techniques are mindless or evil per se. I want to suggest to you only that a lot of AI art becomes much more interesting when it goes beyond mere aesthetics, when it encourages us to see otherwise, to unsee certain congealed sociocultural formations, when it pushes us to ask questions about the nature and structure of the world. So it's kind of, again, linking back to this critical or troublemaking function of art I talked about earlier. So the questions I want to raise with my piece in a more open-ended way than I do in my writing, which is more academic, were as follows. Can machines see? What does it mean for us humans to endow machines with the capacity for seeing? And what does it mean to classify as seeing their ability to differentiate between objects in the world on the basis of the light reflected of them and transmitted to those machines' processors? Do we actually understand how we, humans, how we humans see the world? And is there even a we that does the seeing? Are we in fact seeing machines? So you can say the video is an invitation to deal with questions that computer science often deals with, but in a way that perhaps goes beyond many established paradigms in machine and computer vision. So at the end of the day, you could say that my work around, you know, with the book, with the, you know, follow up to the book is that we need to ask better questions about a lot of the kind of technology we are dealing with. And why? Well, computer vision, which is supposed to teach computers to see like humans only better, is premised on a rather simple idea that vision is primarily a problem of information processing. So vision is basically, basically said to work by finding objects in the world, breaking them down into small squares and mapping them onto computer pixels. Culture really doesn't really come into it at the primary vision stage, only much later. The construction of culture as a separate domain of uninheritable features allows computer scientists to ignore embodied and embedded modes of perception. And this disembodied model of computer vision results in the preservation of one of the biggest science and computer science myths, the belief that data bias, understood as cultural bias, once eliminated, will result in the data that is both pure and fair. We are regularly presented with consequences of such fantasy, of such essentialization of biology in the brain at the expense of cultural traits in cognitive and computer science. Two recent examples include the video conferencing platform Zoom's background algorithm, which removed the head of a black academic anytime he tried to use a virtual background, and Twitter cro the Twitter cropping algorithm, which always privileged the showing of white faces and cropped images in the timeline. While the computer vision machine reveals itself not to be particularly perceptive, the consequences of its racialized blind spots are anything but trivial. Indeed, the algorithms that run within it are the same ones that make decisions about people's social, financial, or legal status, including punitive action at border control, denial of credit, or assignation of criminality. While early Google image recognition algorithm was highlighted in 2015 to auto-tag pictures of black people as gorillas, there is still a problem with face recognition of black females with a high false match rate explained by industry expert as a combination of the difficulty of lighting a black face and the makeup worn. And obviously it's only a difficulty for a particular set of parameters established as the norm. So one factor is that the image databases that serve as training sets for the algorithms are not properly representative being skewed in terms of volume and quality towards photographs of white males. But there is a deeper logic at work here with a whole systemic infrastructure involved in the production of cameras, lighting system, image processing software, and the visual and cultural training of image technicians, photographers, and others that produces a particular set of norms that then can be presented as supposedly objective and objective difficulty in taking a photo of a person with a dark skin. Now, this mode of thinking embedded in all sorts of technologies that precede the digital is what Sophia Noble has described in her book, Algorithms of Oppression, which analyzes the hidden operations of capital, race and gender as technological redlining, suggesting that AI, 
will become a major human rights issue in the 21st century, she issues a call for us all to understand the architecture and logic of algorithmic decision-making tools in masking and deepening social inequality. Noble leaves us no illusion that algorithmic oppression is fundamental to the operating system of the web. It's therefore not enough to just debias the data. Rather, we need to ask bigger questions about the forms of injustice embedded in it. We also have to ask what it means when the elimination of the glitch, while desirable from a technical point of view, ends up making the punitive surveillance running on this data even more efficient. The correction of the data bias doesn't correct the violently penetrative and extractivist logic of the computer vision and AI system. It actually strengthens it. So the question I want to leave you with is, can we do better than that? Can we make smarter AI, but smarter in a sense that goes beyond the instrumentalist logic of computer vision? And I think I'll stop here probably. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna, so much. Uh, you, you left us with so many questions <laughs> that uh, uh, my mind is uh, exploding at the moment. <laughs> and I, I to totally agree that uh, actually we have to begin with asking the right questions. And that the question uh, whether computers can be creative is like misaligned. It's not actually important to uh, answer. And I was wondering, uh, do you think like if, because when you're saying that we need to actually try at least to build a different kind of AI, and I completely agree, like uh, that, I guess in the first place, it's artists who, who have the potential to see beyond this mainstream use of AI and come up with different uh, perspectives. And the, but the question is how can we hack uh, AI for our own, um, you know purposes so it's it's not, it's not just repeating the the same pattern that it was designed by uh, google and other companies well i think the idea would be probably to think at the you know to invite a more diverse group of people to the design table and diverse in you know as we you know, as discussed in my talk in ethnic gender sexuality terms but also diverse in more in, in conceptual, philosophical, uh, in terms of diverse intelligences. So they're, they're diverse neurologically, but also, you know, you need humanities, scholars, philosophers, artists uh, at the table to accompany the kind of engineering project. Because at the moment, and in a way, AI has a very narrow set of parameters. And as I, this whole idea, and as a project, and this whole idea of, oh, let's just go and break things. We are so imaginative. I mean, it's still very much part of a certain form of kind of really uh, kind of capitalism on acid, basically. So what would it mean to try and think about AI working towards a different form of society? Could AI design a fairer, better model of society? Could it think of a different ways? And obviously, so in a way it would be uh, the foundational assumptions of the technology, of the algorithm, of the network would need to be different. And I think that would perhaps be kind of exciting and where this could take us. Yeah, <laughs> let's see. I mean, uh, I think also it's, it's uh, difficult for artists, like when you said uh, that it's... Uh, sorry that we need to invite uh, more diverse uh, people in this design process and then mostly what you also mentioned the uh, uh, google uh, art artist in residency program uh, so do you think like if an artist joins this kind of uh, residency is is uh, is he or she going to have any kind of influence or say or is it just that uh, the company is actually just extracting um, you know, these creative ideas and then like chewing them and using for a completely uh, wrong purpose. Well, and obviously, as I say, I am, I have to admit, I am a little suspicious of the, of the kind of Google AI kind of artist project. 
And for reasons, not because uh, just to say, oh, Google is evil, so anything produced will be evil. <laughs> it's much more complicated than that. And the, the one reason I'm suspicious is even though I've seen some amazing projects coming out of this program, there've been some really interesting work. So what I'm suspicious about is a certain monopolization of who is the, you know, of who the patrons of arts are today, of where patronage comes from, what it means to be deriving kind of cultural production from uh, and to be de- for it to be dependent on particular um, kind of streams of revenue. Also, what to, what does it mean to live in societies that value? Uh, cultural uh, artistic activity less and less. For example, in Britain, our government in its infinite wisdom has just announced the withdrawal, the reduction of funding by 50% of uh, courses in media, creative arts and performance and archeology span as well for some reason. But you know, that's also a, it's a certain design decision on the part of a government. And as they are trying to legitimate all oh, the priorities of the nation are different. We really need to shift energy towards STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths. And, but if you are gonna remove these other ways, other modes of thinking about the world, also you're going to lose something. And you're also um, producing a society that has a very particular set of goals, expectations, kind of desires, and you're, you're shaping it in a, in a certain way. So that's why I'm suspicious of this. I would like to you know, think of, of having societies where there is more value given to, to those, to the humanities, to arts, mm-hmm. to design, which is not always instrumental. And then, yeah, yeah I completely agree. Uh, we have a question in the chat from uh, Anna. Uh, I think the refuge of AI in the last years is linked to the data that allows for machine learning training, which is also directly interlinked with the economic models created by Silicon Valley, like derivatives. Is there an alternative model for data and economy that can back this new artistic AI landscape that we would like to create? Well, it's a great question. And I think a lot of people are trying to work on uh, alternative forms of data collection. But obviously, again, it's very hard because data only makes sense as data if there is a lot of it. So there are people working on data commons, on sharing data, of making it available, uh, you know, on a kind of nonprofit basis. But that would require, you know, it's like you can ask a question, why has there been no alternative to Facebook? It's like te- technologically, it's not so difficult to design. It's not such a complicated design. I mean, it's not even pretty. I and mean, Facebook is so ugly. I still can't believe that, you know, the ugliness of the blue that they chose for their, you know, for, for, for as a color, their background, all of this. But why has they, I mean, there was something called diaspora that emerged a few years ago and was supposed to happen. It didn't happen. But it doesn't happen not because te- technically it's so impossible. Although, of course, you need a kind of human power and technological power, but also because you already have so many people attached to it. So it's very difficult for people people's affective attachments and for you know small businesses who suddenly depending on it for their survival to suddenly say oh yeah we'll just go and explore alternatives so there is that and so that elimination of competition happens so that's why i think it i don't think there is an alternative model as yet uh, but i think there are people working on it exploring on models and you know in some way because i'm you know quite I mean, the idea of regulation, I'm quite European in that, in the sense that I do believe that some forms of regulation, I think what the European Commission is trying to do with forms of regulation towards, uh, uh, towards some of the companies and also around taxation, I think that could be one mechanism, could be one mechanism that will get, you know, things done, things failed, and maybe that could be a tool that will actually enact something uh, that will reverberate then and allow for others to. So, you know, these ideas have to come from different camps, I suppose. Yes, thank you. Uh, We have another question from Paolo. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, Thank you for a wonderful lecture, Joanna, and I also want to thank you, uh, the organizers team, for a wonderful job they are doing. I was wondering, uh, since you, uh, draw also uh, from uh, Wilhelm Flusser and uh, his theory of photography. And uh, I'm sure uh, most of us are familiar with uh, the uh, place the invention of camera had in the art history. Uh, I was wondering, um, 
if you, however uh, I'm aware how problematic the historical comparisons can be, I was wondering uh, to what extent do you think uh, the event that was the invention of camera uh, is comparable to that event that is the AI in the recent decade? As we knew in the camera that it uh, practically embodied formerly exclusively human capacity to mimetic uh, representation. Uh, mm -hmm. Now we have artificial intelligence uh, taking over from us a uh, certain masterfulness uh, that we uh, associate with the intelligence with personality. And now we have it uh, uh, intelligence that doesn't need personality to uh, manifest uh, such, such capacity. So mm -hmm. to what extent do you think those two events are com uh, comparable? Well, actually, I've been thinking about some, can you hear a weird echo? Some, some strange, okay, some strange echoing has happened. Okay, so that, I mean, it is a great question because it's it relates to very much to what I've been thinking about at the moment in terms of historical, uh, historical moments that are of great significance. And as part of it, I'm working on a project now called Does Photography of a Future? And uh, I'm trying to kind of map out the invention, the significant inventions that have happened in modernity with regard to human and machine vision and what consequence and what's, what's the link with the similarities. I think that comparison makes sense as a thought device. I was looking at the camera and the invention of camera, you know, also working here with Flusser and others, and it's linked to, you know, the technology of uh, uh, of time, kind of noticing time, uh, you know, also the telegraph emerged around this time. So you could kind of capture, you could still time, you could measure it. Then you had the kind of digital photography did quite a lot as well, because it allowed for a certain, and you could co connect it as well with globalization with that around the time. And obviously I'm not saying that digital photography caused globalization, it's not as simple as that, but there is a certain confluence of forces you could say around the time of their emergence. And then the third moment for me would be precisely AI, and especially with regard to image production, what happens, which is kind of connected with this um, odd sense of fragmentation, kind of return to nationalism, post-nationalism, this moment, political moment for which we don't yet have a, a, a kind of name because we're in the midst of it. So on the one hand, there's a sudden return to political certainties. They turn to the right across the world in lots of different places. And what does it mean around it? On the one hand, a complete openness of the image, the possibility of deep fakes, the possibility, you know, the image is already constructed after the image, it doesn't really stop. So around some of, of that. And on the other hand, the return to these kind of demagogues, be it like Orban or Kaczynski in Poland or T Trump or, or Boris in, in the UK, who kind of offer you truth. They are the kind of these you know, post-digital prophets, if you like, who is almost like offsetting that instability. So that, I think, is something that is worth looking at, studying as an as a, as a point of, of inquiry. And we have another question. Uh, what, resp what response is AI art trying to achieve on humans in the future? Where does sentiment fit in? Will AI ever move people, make them feel something human? Um, yeah, well, again, I think to answer this question well, would probably we would probably need to agree on a definition of AI, because at the moment, I mean, AI is like an approximation of AI. So it's artificial intelligence that performs certain tasks quite well, but, you know, we don't yet have artificial general intelligence. So if we've got something that copies a painting, I mean, people have been moved by some paintings copied by, you know, by uh, by from kind of the style transfer paintings that resemble a great master. Some of them have solved, you know, people have been moved to spend an insane amounts of money at Sotheby's and other auction houses because they've seen them. So I think it is possible for this AI or semi-AI that we have now to move people. But the question of sentiment as well is, I think the, for me, the, the interesting question arising from this would be, you know, can AI have sentiment? We obviously have sentiment analysis now that is, you know, taken from humans. We're often divided a bit like machine vision. Humans are divided into categories of sentiment expressed supposedly in our, you know, facial features. And then it's, uh, 
it, it would kind of training machines as well to to uh, to do that. But the question would be, you know, will uh, will uh, AI make us feel something human again? AI is now used, algorithms are used to do that device cinema these days. I mean, Netflix, I mean, people obviously uh, ex ex uh, experience all sorts of emotions in Netflix. I mean, it's supposed to, if you like something, you're supposed to like something similar to it and the algorithm leads you to it. So in that sense, you could say the one of the primary functions of uh of algorithms today, and I'm using AI and algorithms interchangeably here, so you would have to have a whole kind of theoretical paper on it, but I think we can do that. But is precisely to make people feel something human, to make people like something more, or, you know, think about Tinder as well. Thank you. Uh, maybe I would uh, link to that, uh, that uh, when you mentioned uh, this not very nice metaphor for AI art and Candy, candy Crush. Uh, I totally uh, have uh, feelings for that because uh, like a few years back, I, I was really uh, addicted to Candy Crush. <laughs> so I can confirm that it's very mesmerizing. Mm -hmm. But my question is, uh, when, you, when you are saying in your talk that this is, this is like watching it, uh, looking at AI art, it's like, can be disorienting and it can challenge our perception. Couldn't that as well, like be, have some positive effect on us or on our uh, way, how we are thinking, or maybe couldn't that in some way, maybe open our eyes? No, absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, it could do all sorts of things. And sometimes it's not even, possible to determine that this is a good result and this is a bad result from AI. But absolutely, it can make us feel all sorts of things. It can stir things in us. It could open things up. But that's why I was also talking about this notion of the paragon. So the term comes from art history, but this additional, this framing. So in a way, the work by itself obviously can achieve something, but maybe it's also interesting when that piece of art produced by AI or like Leonel Mura, this kind of little robot on a piece of paper, uh, AI running together with the artist, uh, when it provokes as well a certain conversation, a certain stare, a shift in society and shift in capabilities of, of our understanding of what's possible, that maybe is, is. so in a way, those kind of artifacts by themselves, like, is it beautiful? Is it amazing? What does it do? I suppose they don't interest me that much. And, uh, but maybe it's more generally, it's nothing to do with AI, but more with a model of art I'm interested in, this art being of the world, or is connecting with something rather than just individual kind of masterpieces that are kind of appreciated and they are singular uh, beauty or, or technical uh, expertise. Yeah, thank you. I totally agree. Uh, the, is, are there any questions now in, in Zoom? Because maybe if someone wanted to ask a question uh, by themselves. Uh, yeah, I, I could ask a question if that is okay. Yeah. Well, Joanna, thank you very much for the talk. It was fantastic to, to hear also how you have threaded uh, Simon Dorn and Flusser through through all these topics. My, I, I would be very curious to know where do you place yourself in the spectrum of possibility of AI in terms of transhumanism? Do you, do you see it as a possibility that uh, AI is going to lead us into a general artificial intelligence, et cetera? I suppose I, uh, my answer is that I have no idea. And I suspect that most other people who make these predictions have no idea either, but they like making predictions. So if I was making a, you know, a few a, a feature film or a work of science fiction, I could go and experiment with it. But I generally have no idea. I mean, I think it would be naive to think that we are the culmination of uh, the development, but you know, we could develop into another species, but we might as well become extinct as well. I mean, it could go either way. I, whether I believe that humans are an eternal species that will go against the laws of evolution and will live forever, probably not. But, you know, 
at the moment, the jury is still out. When you think about what's happening to our climate, what's happening to the planet, what's happening to the rate of extinction of different species. So whether we're just going to evolve into uh, another species, in another kind of species, or whether AI will become an alternative form of, of being to us with a higher intelligence, or whether there won't be time for any of this because, you know, people will be trying to sort out the basic problem of machine vision for self-driving cars, which is not working at the moment, contrary to what Silicon Valley tells you. In the meantime, sea levels will rise. The planet will be more and more messed up. Elon Musk and his friends will go to Mars, and the rest of us will just slowly kind of you know, as a species disappears. So I don't know, but it could go a different way. We could come up with some solutions. Again, geoengineering, I am not so hot on, but, uh, but that's where I stand. So I'm not a transhumanist in that sense, but I think all of these possibilities are on the table, but they're not of equal value because so the constraints are environmental, they are material, they're also political. And, you know, and politicians just think about, you know, three to four year time towards, you know, their re-election, so. And there is uh, one question in the uh, YouTube chat that I think might uh, wrap it up nicely. Uh, oh, there is also another question, but okay. Uh, I'm already started with this one. Um, so it's a, a question for advice uh, for artists but also for computer scientists to follow. So the AI art is not just another version of Candy Crush and the visual pleasure, but rather an art with added critical value. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the advice would be as well, and, and from you know, see that festival is in a way, I think an example of what I'm talking about, this idea of network production of art. It doesn't mean that you always have to make things with other people, but to recognize the, the kind of value of figuring things out in groups. I mean, art, as I tried to, to kind of show, argue is that art's always been a network production in spite of this idea of the separate kind of, you know, individual genius who stands there, wins awards. And uh, it's interesting in Britain this year, all the nominees for the Turner Prize, our key art prize are collectives. And I think it's interesting, it's symbolic and the pandemic in a way, even in this obviously, terrible situation of us locked in and home, but has created and visualized this network kind of collaboration, the community of, of minds and bodies as well, because we suffer exhaustion, we suffer all sorts of things. On the one hand, we all these digital avatars for one another. On the other hand, we're kind of aware of, of those communities of thought. So I think the advice for artists would be to, to kind of work with your networks, to recognize that kind of intermeshing of ideas to kind of try and form collectives. And, you know, even if you prefer sometimes to work on your own, do your own things, maybe that's completely okay as well, but to recognize how your networks nourish you and how to make the networks you are part of as an artist, but also in your, you know, professionals. I mean, many artists also work, be it in, you know, all sorts of jobs, often nothing to do with art how to make those networks a bit more nourishing and how to nourish them and how to make the whole practice a bit less extractivist and less kind of ego aggrandizing, I suppose. But... Yeah, I think that's a really good advice. And uh, Anna was asking a question and then it turned out actually to be a comment. Uh, do you want to maybe uh, ask it yourself? Hi, uh, I don't have my camera on today. I, no, it was just a comment. I think, this, uh, thank you very much for this very, very informative uh, lecture and I'm looking forward to reading the book. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I have this thought all through this um, discussion that we're very much uh, talking about a certain utopia that, I mean, this, it's a very utopian talk that we're having here and uh, subjects such as alternatives for AI based on different data sets or uh, the very idea of like really det detaching ourselves from big tech or uh, general AI. I think they're very utopian ideas. So it was just a thought which I had because you were mentioning Elon Musk and I was just saying that all the Elon Musks in plural, they have this idea that singularity is just around the corner because this is what they, what they want to sell to society. Whereas I think if you talk to technologists, most of the time they will tell you 
uh, that uh, general AI is not really on the table and has never been on the table. So it was just like this, because we, we all, you were also talking before about how uh, art, uh, like this, this idea of um, sort of uh, coming out from a, from the babble, uh, you know, like art, the bringing it maybe. So I, I just wanted to bring it down into more a practical uh, sphere of art impacting reality and just find that probably uh, we're also talking about utopian visions. So this was just a general comment on this, but thanks so much for the food for thought. Food, food, Roboros, food, I'm gonna make this you know, joke here. <laughs> food for thought, eating its own tail. Okay, thanks. Thank you, thank you very much. And just to speak, say something briefly as well about Elon Musk. And uh, so what I've also, because I think you're absolutely right about this idea of singularity becoming basically a product and a fantasy that is supposed to sell a certain kind of concept, a vision of the world of, for you know, a group of people who become so wealthy that they can't imagine that world to be subject to the laws of, of, kind of nature, if you like, that have um, existed for, 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 and, and you know, regulate the universe, the laws of physics, the laws of everything else. And while I'm interested in you know, opening up, breaking laws of physics, discovering new ones, I'm very suspicious of Elon Musk. And as a kind of response, and also with regard to an earlier question about my position, whether I was a transhumanist, posthumanist. So I did this other, in this little book called The End of Man, a feminist counter apocalypse. So, and it's really an attempt to think against the kind of Silicon Valley bros such as Elon Musk. And it's a free book, freely available. So, my feminist counter apocalypse is also an attempt to try and think slightly differently about those link linkages and configurations beyond just shipping ourselves off to Mars. And Elon is not taking everyone anyway, it's just a very small group can go. So are there any other questions in the audience? Maybe I would just ask very quick questions and maybe very simple question. But first, thank you very much, Joanna, for the, for the talk. It is really fantastic. Mm -hmm. When Anna was speaking, asking you, uh, she had a workshop at this festival about learning the very basics of AI, you know, like AI for dummies, uh, like learn through cooking. And I was thinking, how do you feel it from your position as a pedagogue, as a professor? You know, how is the AI literacy? How, what is the state of it? Uh, how is AI being taught at universities? And is there some gap that is emerging or that is probably already there? Also in terms of, you know, you speak very critically about all those Elon Musks and how are self-driving vehicles being presented in media, but actually they don't have the function. Uh, function it's just speculation or fantasy. So, is there some kind of a gap that you know between those who can know and 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 cannot know, and how can we fix the gap? Well, I think there is a gap. It's a gap of disciplinarity that we talked about earlier, where things get you know taught and how they get taught. So I'm in the media department. There are a lot of my colleagues are working on about AI and issues of social justice and uh, issues of, kind of uh, exclusion, all of this. But, uh, and then there are other sections and, you know, Goldsmith as a whole is a quite creative institution where these questions get raised. But a lot of kind of AI design that happens in other places it's not involved with, with some of these questions. So it's a disciplinary gap between those who are making stuff and those who are now seeing all these critics as a waste of time and basically spoiling their fun, and then others who may be asking these questions, but the levels of literacy are kind of probably limited. And I mean, there's a lot of interesting work now, obviously with pl platforms such as ML Runway and uh, where artists can get their hands uh, kind of dirty with uh, picking up some of the kind of technical, uh, uh, you know, without learning to code from scratch. And again, I don't think that everyone should code. I think people should understand what it means to code and what it means that algorithms organize our universe. But I don't think coding as such, it's, uh, I don't think it's, I'm not saying this because I don't believe it's important. It's extremely important, but I don't think, you know, everyone should code, but I think everyone should have algorithmic literacy in the sense of understanding what it means to live in an algorithmic society. Are there any other questions? Uh, 
Oh, maybe I can keep on going with comments <laughs> if, if we have some time. Is that okay? Uh, so uh, as an extension to the, and, and also more uh, reflection than, than a question, maybe it turns into a question later, but um, in terms of algorithmic lit literacy, I have a feeling that now we are starting also to see some of the effects from the other side of the, from a design perspective, from the, from the other side of the, of the interface in terms of how people are approaching interfaces and how those interfaces were designed for a user in mind mm. uh, using artificial intelligence. And we're starting to discover that the attitude as a user and the role of the user is radically changing and really, really fast. This, this, um, this, I, I thought about this when I, when I saw the episode of the I am not a cat Mm -hmm. You remember uh, that one? So it was basically a Zoom call in which um, a Zoom call for some sort of legal procedure happening in the United States, mm -hmm. and one of the of the of the attendees, which was um, I don't remember exactly which uh, position, which uh, role he had, uh, some sort of lawyer or. Um, so he attended to the meeting with the judge and the other party, et cetera. And because the person that had been using Zoom before him was um, some um, work colleague in the office and they had, uh, I don't know if it was a he or she, she had been using a filter of a cat. When he joined Zoom, the filter was on and he couldn't remove the filter and of course, a very absurd and hilarious conversation ensued in which he had to come to remind the interlocutors that he was in fact not a cat. And, and I understand the hilarity of the situation, but the, the way I read this, this, this event was more of actually he didn't realize he had, he was not a simple user. He didn't realize he was approaching a simple interface in which his identity wouldn't be mediated. Yeah. He should have had the possibility to reflect on his role as one more of curator of his own identity. And that didn't happen. And because that didn't happen, we, we, we all had a laugh. But I, I think it, there's, there's something there. But... Well, and that's, 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 you know, obviously it's very thought provoking what's happening with all those interfaces. And some of them have become so invisible. Like even, you know, the Zoom interface is interesting as well. What does it mean to have every human being just as a head in a rectangle. And that's how we, for the last year, we've been seeing lots of other humans from all over the world and a certain uniformity to it. But also that's on the visual level, but also on the level going back to pedagogy, to teaching, to what happens. It's like the material produced, there is so much material, so much content produced, so many lectures being recorded. Soon you will not need philosophers, professors, writers, because then, you know, you've got the, you know, what is it, the algorithm GTA3 that kind of writes. Uh, uh, so, and so on the basis of all these lectures we've recorded and we fed to AI, you'll be able to create new lectures on AI, you know, say you put the first paragraph from my talk, add, you know, do a critique, add a bit of feminism, a bit of machine vision, and material will be presented. And in terms of, you know, questions of the elimination of, of, of uh, the value of meaningful engagement, and maybe, you know, that this is something that is going to, to happen, I think, to, to all of us. And because we will get these simulations of, of meaningful engagement through because AI, AI will repeat and produce something, but who will be the interlocutor for it? And how will the interface will completely kind of uh, become invisible? And yet, obviously, it will also become a barrier for others to, you know, to join, not to join, to cross, not cross. So yes, the, the kind of pandemic interface is also interesting, this idea of in kind of intimacy, closeness, distance. And, and obviously it's not all bad, I mean, because in lots of ways, it's great that we can do it. And it, the idea, I mean, it is very, very moving and very seductive. And it's lots of ways we can do things through this that it would be harder to do for all sorts of reasons. 
not just you know travel but like you know who can afford to travel who can afford to move so the price of you know seeing each other as rectangles being sat at home most of the time it also comes with a certain capabilities of connection and yet longer term we kind of can ask questions about what does it mean to have all this material feeding the database mm -hmm. Yeah, I am wondering if that happens, if we will be able to notice mm. that we are, we are looking at uh, synthetic presenters presenting some synthesized uh, lecture. Yes, yes. The... <laughs> okay. Um, I think uh, we are probably, we reached uh, some kind of uh, end. Uh, no, there are no other questions. As far as I know, I'm, I'm looking at all the platforms. So I think, yeah, I think there are none. So thank you, Jana, so much for this inspiring uh, discussion as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the questions. Yes. And best of luck with the rest of the festival. Thank you so much. So I hope uh, you, you will also find something interesting in our archive. archive. Because yes. we are also feeding now. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> database. I, I look forward to exploring it. Yeah. So I will. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much.